we're going to have Mr. Norris McDonald. Norris. Thank you, Al. My name is Norris McDonald. I'm founder and president of the Center for Environment, Commerce, and Energy. And we also have an outreach arm called the African American Environmentalist Association. I was also president of the American Association of Blacks and Energy, Washington, D.C. chapter back in 1881 to 83. I, organi I organized the first energy brain trust for the late Congressman Vicki Leland back in 1980, and that was in cooperation with the American Association of Blacks and Energy. But when it comes to energy and energy policy, I guess we're in a pickle. And to start off, let me say with the electric utility industry, I'm worried about the electric utility industry. I'm worried that they will be the next bailout candidate. <laughs> Quiet as it's kept. Of any of the sectors that I look at, I would not want to be in the utility business. You talk about uncertainty. Businessmen like certainty. I'm a market guy. Businessmen like certainty. And you know what the most uncertain market out here, it has to be the utility sector, the electric utility sector. It's a nightmare. It's a blizzard of regulatory and market challenges that are unbelievable to me. And so as quiet as it's kept, and they don't talk about it, they won't say anything about it, uh, I suspect that they're in trouble. And let me just give you a little bit of quick history about that. And part of it is because of botched deregulation. A number of different areas tried to deregulate, but they botched it. They messed it up. They deregulated the wholesale section, but kept the regular. The, uh, uh, the retail section regulated. So that the utilities couldn't raise their rates, they put caps on the rates, and so this is coming on the roost everywhere from California to the East Coast, whereas now they're put in a position of having to raise rates as much as 75 to 100% just to get back to even board. They don't want to talk about it because the politicians start screaming and hollering, but they're gonna to have to raise rates significantly just to get back to even board. That doesn't count all of this equipment they're talking about. I mean, these scrubbers now, it terrifies me how much these things cost. Everything, I'm old, I'm old, I look young. <laughs> but I go back 10 years and you know, scrubbers cost $100 million. I'm like, wow, you put all that stuff on there you described? That's about a billion dollars now, something like that, am I close? That is scary, or two. For, that's just the scrubber part. Like you said, it takes up about half of your um, space. That's a whole other facility, and the public doesn't think about that, and it doesn't generate profit for the utility, particularly they put in rate base for the regulated utilities. It is that, I won't get into too much of their issue because I have some territory covered, but being inside and looking at what they have to do, and then of course I deal with my community, the environmental community. I came up through the environmental community. They, we do everything we can to trip them up. We don't mess you up. We saw the litigation. Then there's the regulatory part, and I deal with that. I'm in Washington, so I deal from federal and I testify at the state level. As, um, as Bob pointed out, the, 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 the measure changes every now and then. Every time they look up, you have CARE, you have the Clean Air Mercury Rule. That frustrated me to death. I lobbied Congress on the Clear Skies Initiative, which set up these particular um, strategies, because I get frustrated. I'm a chronic acute asthmatic. I've almost died twice from asthma. You know, it's always, uh, I, I have my nebulizer over in the corner. It's always scary for me to travel around. So I take air issues very seriously. And so when, when I see society from the political sector to the private sector when nothing is happening, as Bob described, all of a sudden, you know, it takes three years. It takes all these different time frames. The uh, Clear Skies Initiative was a, was a, um, a cap and trade issue. It was, the Democrats opposed it back then. They opposed this Clear Skies Initiative. Now the Democrats are supporting cap and trade. This would have worked, in my opinion, as you see it. Now they got rid of that in the courts that are starting all over. Before an asthmatic, that's horrible for me when it comes to ozone, particular matter, because we're not making any progress. New source review and these different regulations where they keep moving the um, moving the yardstick and utilities have to try to adjust to this. You look at solutions, let me get right to the fact that we believe that uh, climate change is the most serious environmental issue facing us today, and that's why we try to come up with these solutions. We have a program called the Energy Defense Reservation Program. And just quickly, what that would involve would be the Defense Department working with the utility sector. 
Unfortunately, even though we support nuclear power, the plants have become too expensive. When we first came out in support back in 2000, they projected the plants would cost a billion dollars. Now they're saying at least $10 billion. So although we like the technology, Wall Street probably isn't going to pony up the money to shoot the whole ranch on one project. Um, so that's where we come up with these energy defense reservations that would um, cooperate with the utility sector because you do have these challenges. Number one is they have money, so they can put up a good deal of the money for these plants. What we do is try to solve a lot of problems with the energy defense reservation idea. It would basically also convert carbon dioxide into gasoline. People haven't really heard about that. You can actually turn carbon dioxide into gasoline. What we would do is use a nuclear <coughs> plant with a coal plant so that you could use oxy combustion. He talked about the supercritical boiler. You can also burn coal in a pure oxygen environment called oxy combustion to reduce the carbon dioxide footprint. You can use a nuclear plant to split water produce hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen would go for oxy combustion in the power plant. The hydrogen would go for production of fuel cells. And then, of course, the hopefully with the military and the cooperation of Congress, this is bold vision. You can have a piping system where you can convert carbon dioxide into diesel fuel and then gasoline. It's called the Fischer-Tropes method. It's the same method of coal to liquids that the Germans developed. It's the Fischer-Tropes method. It's just taking it one step further where you convert carbon dioxide into gasoline, and I can answer questions about that later. So these are just some of the few challenges and some of the <sighs> solutions we come up with. Let me add one more wrinkle into this as I close, and that is it's not complex enough. Let's just not deal with um, the energy requirements and the regulatory requirements and the market requirements. Let's throw rates in just to make it a little bit more interesting. <laughs> Um, and that is that blacks do not own any energy infrastructure in the United States. Now when I say that, some of the guys say, well, so-and-so owns this and so-and-so owns that. I know about Case of Law down in Houston and NDR and natural gas. For the most part, blacks do not own energy infrastructure in the United States. And I think that has to change. This is the American Association of Blacks in Energy. And that's something that needs to be addressed. One part I like about a carbon market is that if everyone can participate, then I think you can come up with innovations. And that's one of the items we'll be pushing in the national legislation, that everyone can hold and trade carbon dioxide allowances. We're registered in the acid rain program. We can hold and trade sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide um, allowances. We're registered in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast, Reggie, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Anyone can hold allowances. We want the same thing in the carbon dioxide area, and we believe that will lead to innovation. Whereas on the regulatory side, they're worried about the paperwork, and so they're trying to get those numbers up. You heard 75,000 tons per year, um, also up to 250,000 tons a year, and that will get a lot of the big um, areas. But what you don't get is guys like me and the little guys who will come up with innovations that could mess around and somehow help these guys out. So getting back to the racial component, we need to get in the energy sector across the board. Oil, natural gas, nuclear power, coal. <coughs> and one question I ask in places where I speak and give it some thought is, should blacks own coal mines in a global warming world? 